We're here with Jerry Randell. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Celine. Uh, my name is Celine Rojan, and I'm an occupational psychologist, uh, a member of the BPS Division of Occupational Psychology, and um, I'm also a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. I'm delighted to be here with you today and to be talking to you uh, as part of the interview series on pioneering members of the Division of Occupational Psychology, the DOP. Mm -hmm. Um, just to briefly explain what we mean by pioneering, by mm. pioneering we mean members of the Division of Occupational Psychology that have been instrumental in the creation of the division in 1971, that have been um, instrumental or contributed to its success in the early stages and all the way through really. So people such as yourself. Before we start really with some of the questions that I have for you, I wanted to ask you, Jerry, to tell us a little bit more about yourself, about your background. How did you come to be a psychologist? Well, my school thought I could become a chemist. Mm -hmm. Quite a nice upmarket boys' school in West London, to which I got a scholarship, of course. You know, my parents could not afford fees. Uh, and I worked as a chemist. I stayed on to do some examinations to f get into university. And I, I then, between leaving school in middle of the Easter term and being called up into the Air Force, I worked as a chemist, mm -hmm. which was great fun. But then I was called up, as uh, we all were in those days, and uh, was put into personnel selection. So I spent two years selecting uh, apprentices, air crew mainly, and a certain amount of officer selection mm -hmm. at RAF Hornchurch, the old Battle of Britain yeah. station. So the thought occurred, this psychology racket seemed a bit, a bit interesting. Predicting the behaviour of people struck me as being a bit more interesting as predicting the behaviour of chemicals. Mm -hmm. If you put two chemicals together, and they don't work as they could be, you've mixed them wrongly. Right. If you put two people together and they don't work as well as you think they could, yeah. you blame the people. <laughs> so it struck me as well an easier profession than, than chemistry. Yeah. So I'd had a university entrance, uh, but uh, a friend of mine had gone up to Nottingham and uh, I was in contact with him. He was you know, one of the personnel selection assessors and said he was having a great time. If I came up, they have a psychology department. Would you, uh, you could stay with me? Mm -hmm. It sounded nice. So uh, I got an interview with Jack Sprott, who is his professor of psychology at the time. He was quite impressed by my knowledge of psychometrics from the RAF and gave me a space. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were only six people yeah. <laughs> in the first year in those days. So I went to Nottingham and did psychology. Uh, which was uh, really rather great. So when I came out, uh, when I finished and graduated, I got various jobs in market research uh, mm -hmm. with my statistics, because statistics was a part of my, my psychology degree. Uh, but then I saw an advertisement for industrial psychologists wanted you know, to work on electronic computers, because we didn't know what these, those things were mm -hmm. in those days. And it turned out to be at Cadby Hall, which is in Hammersmith, which is quite near my school and not too far from where I lived in southwest London. And surprise, surprise, I got the job. I didn't know anything about industrial psychology, although I'd done a course at Nottingham. Yeah. Uh, so they trained me in computer programming, okay. which was fun. And I worked on the Leo computer, 2K, twice as big as this room. The computer industry was suffering. Uh, it wasn't getting any, anywhere. Wedgwood Ben, who was a minister in the Labour government at the time, tried to knock together all the disparate computer firms that existed in England at this time. This was the 50s, by the way, mm -hmm. okay, to work together. He, he could see where the competition was coming from in America and Japan, but they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, they had all their own little things and they they weren't doing at all well, and I fell out a bit with them myself because I'm not averse to putting my head above the parapet mm. on these occasions. So they transferred me into operations research for Joe Lyons, uh, which was uh, another interesting job. I could use all my statistics. I mm -hmm. could work out the taste of 
uh, chocolate and buns and Swiss rolls mm -hmm. and things. But all through this time, I was doing my masters at Birkbeck because when I first graduated, my plan was to go off to do an MBA, a newfangled MBA yeah. in Chicago, where my best friend was the British Overseas Airways office manager. So he said I could stay with him, I could get some part-time work with BOAC and do my MBA part-time at, what's it called, Northwestern, I think, the mm -hmm. University at Chicago. Uh, however, no, before all that could come about, my mother became very ill, so I obviously stayed. She died at the Christmas mm -hmm. after I graduated. By that time, I was immersed in Birkbeck. Yeah. So I stayed with Birkbeck, uh, and, uh, and again, uh, no, it was very convenient. It was on the D Piccadilly line from Hammersmith yeah. up to Russell Square. Mm -hmm. So that was my life, three evenings a week. Uh, working quite hard during the day for lives, getting on quite well, uh, and uh, doing my master's work mm -hmm. at Berkers. Uh, then Alec Roger sidled up to me, he was a funny little man, uh, <laughs> and said, uh, Jerry, there's no future in this computer business. Look at them, they're always breaking down. Uh, they're expensive, you know, they're hard to use, you know, and in any way, you're not cut out for commerce. I think you're far more likely to do well as an academic. And I have an assistant lectureship coming up, and I'd like yeah. you to have it. Yeah. So I said, Alec, I can't afford it. No. By then I was married. No. Our first child was on the way. And uh, he said, well, I can give you, you know, extra lectures at LSC and mm -hmm. Lamiby Park, where they trained youth employment officers to up your income. Uh, and he said, you can be offered jobs back into industry quite easily, but to be offered a tenured job in the University of London doesn't come all that frequently. Mm. So that's how I became an academic, yeah. an academic psychologist. I did my master's dissertation on the selection of computer programmers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you would. And I, everything. because I, had, no, I, I still had friends in Lyons, one Saturday morning they analysed it for me, all my data, uh, on the Leo computer, mm -hmm. 990 correlations in flash of a finger. Yeah. So that was my uh, dissertation done. Of course, at the time would have been very impressive. I have a feeling that that may have been the first social science yeah. dissertation to be done on a computer, but I have no evidence for that, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. If we think now mo a bit more about perhaps some theories or research findings in occupational psychology, or in psychology um, as a whole, I was wondering what are the things that have impressed you most or what are the research findings, the theories, the models, the experiments that have perhaps had the most uh, impact on you and on your career? Alec Roger was uh, dead keen that we could know the history of our trade. Uh, so he started with Münsterberg, mm -hmm. 1913 and all that. Uh, and very quickly went on to the Health of Munitions Workers Committee and the Industrial Health Research Board, which followed it after the First World War. Uh, and these were staffed by uh, top-notch researchers who were looking into some of the key issues of the time, one of which was, is there a relationship between the hours that people spend at work and how much work they do? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in 1917-18, the average weekly hours of a munitions worker was about 60. And I think the fellow's name was Wyatt, who wrote the first reports. And he did a very good uh, database study mm -hmm. uh, correlating hours of work. And he, how he brought it about and got some munitions factories to change their hours so he could collect his data. Yeah. And in the end, showed without doubt that by reducing the hours of some of these munitions workers, mm -hmm. uh, you increase their productivity. Yeah. Now, this was shattering in 1918. And it went on to set up the IHRB, the Industrial Health Research Board, mm -hmm. uh, which did great work in the early 20s. And all manner of things like rest pauses, working conditions, the beginning of sort of ergonomics mm -hmm. can be traced back 
to those IHRB reports. They're absolute gems mm. in terms of thoroughness in their methodology and the cl clarity of their findings. So that was powerful. And then, of course, the Hawthorne investigations. Yeah. Uh, OK, nowhere near as thorough as the, uh, the British IHRB studies, uh, but nevertheless extremely well-intentioned. I mean, as you know, Elton Mayo was a s Australian, and uh, it may not be widely known, but he was called back by his pal, who he'd met in the army in, in, in mm -hmm. France, uh, because of productivity in his fellow's textile factory in P Pittsburgh. And he uh, saw again that they were being overworked. He put mm -hmm. camp beds, ex-army camp beds, down in all between the... Uh, between the uh, looms, I suppose they were. Mm -hmm. And again, productivity went up. And that, and on the basis of this, that's how he got into Western Electric yeah. to do the famous Hawthorne studies. Yeah. But then I could talk about Frank Bunker Gilbreth, Frederick Winslow Taylor, all these are the people, I think, they're all oldies, of course. Mm -hmm. I think one of the sadnesses of, of current day occupational psychology is I, I, I get the impression that people don't know about all these things. You know, and, they th and they think, unless it's you, it's not powerful enough. Mm. To, and it's sad because way back, some of the work was absolutely top notch. I know you said that most of the, the discoveries and most of the more impressive studies and findings were early. Is there anything that in recent times has, has impressed you? Oh, yes, indeed, yes. I, I, uh, Cattell was a chemist, R.B. Cattell, mm -hmm. James Cattell. Uh, he started life as a chemist, and uh, and uh, how, how he think he got into 16 pf. Again, it's through computers. Now, he realised when he was in Chicago that they had a computer, mainly doing uh, naval trajectory uh, calculations for shooting big guns of ships, uh, and he got access to the computer overnight. And on the basis of this, he was able to do all the factor analytic work, which mm. produced 16 pf. Mm. Uh, and I think 16PF is really, again, the fundamental instrument of uh, all the thousands of different instruments we have these days for measuring so-called human inclinations. Then, of course, the, the, the thing that tapped it was when Costa and McRae got together all the stuff they could lay their hands on, again, in an American army computer, and came up with the, uh, the big five. Mm. And I think that's impressive work. Yeah. And influential work. Very influential, I agree. I mean... I think they're all searching for, like us ex-chemists, the periodic table of traits. Who would you then say is perhaps your occupational psychology hero? Oh, God. It has to be Alec. Okay. Alec Roger. Alec Roger, yes. Mm -hmm. He invented the term. He lifted me out of commerce. He supported my... When I said to him, Alec, look, no, I love working at Birkbeck. I've now got three kids. No, I, I don't like the travelling in and out from the suburbs or deep suburbs into Burt, but getting home late at night is not fun. Uh, Alec came up to me and said, there's a funny little man uh, from Bradford uh, who's setting up a business school. and He wants someone to go up and head up psychology at his business school in Bradford, whatever they are, he said. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, would you like to go and have a sniff at it? Mm -hmm. So I said, well, yes, Alec, you know, fine. So up I went and uh, was most impressed by A, the, what they were trying to do, the flexibility of writing the syllabus and the curricula. So I suppose he was maybe your occupational hero, occupational psychology hero from a personal point of view. Yes. If we're thinking more in terms of um, research findings again, so you mentioned, for example, Cattell, yes. uh, you mentioned uh, Mayo and the Hawthorne studies. Oh dear, yes. Is there anyone that you think this person has really had a very great impact on occupational psychology? This person is my hero. Well, that's difficult. There's so many. Mm -hmm. Perhaps Ray Cattell. Yes, uh, he wrote in 1966 uh, the handbook of multivariate experimental psychology on which I based my PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, a magnificent, but not, not he, it's a collection of chapters. 
uh, on how multi multivariate analysis uh, can be used uh, to really take forward our methodologies. Uh, and uh, I tried to use them. I, I taught myself multivariate, because you weren't taught multivariate statistics. Don't know how far they're taught today. Uh, but uh, but I, was, I was well into computers back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, so I could see what th they were driving at. And uh, I tried to, uh, you know, my PA I've had 20 PhD students. I tried, about half of them have done using multivariate analysis under my influence on their thesis, yeah. because I think that's the way ahead. Uh, and, but the sad thing is, I don't see much of it. But when I look at the papers being produced at DOP conferences, I don't see much use of multivariate analysis. Mm. People may go to SPSS, but most of them don't seem to understand its depth and strengths. Mm. It's sad, really, because that's, that's way ahead. You've had uh, an illustrious career. So, for example, you won several Lifetime Achievements Awards. Made me think I've got many lives. <laughs> <laughs> you've published numerous articles. You've worked in industry and in academia, in leadership positions. What would you say was the highlight, or what were the highlights, or what are you particularly proud of? It took me 15 years to get out that out, uh, and it summarizes uh, all the way back to my thesis. Mm -hmm. uh, and I struggled and struggled and struggled. But it was only John Topless, who was a student with me at Birkbeck, who came forward at the Chester Dot Conference when I was yeah. receiving one of my awards. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned the book, and he said, I'll help you to finish it if you like. Uh, and that was great. And uh, so we finished it, and, uh, and I'm very, very pleased with it. And what have you been up to recently, after you finished the book after 15 years? You know, my, my title was Professor of Organisational Behaviour. Yeah. OK. I've been in this lovely town now for three years, and I was appalled at the way Settle Market Square is such a wasted resource, you know, full of cars. You know. So I've been leading a campaign with trying to behave, trying to get Settle Town Council to change their behaviour, to support the proposal which has been made over many years to pedestrianise parts of Settle yeah. Town Square. Um, my next question is really about the, the general public. So I have the feeling that nowadays people are slowly starting to understand perhaps a bit more what we mean when we talk about occupational psychology. I think we had a long way to go and I, st I think there is still a long way to go. What were and what do you think may still be the challenges to promoting occupational psychology? Oh, yes, another bee in my bonnet. <laughs> oh, how many years I've been trying to get this through to the profession. How individuals and organisations come to work as they do. Yeah. Uh, we put ourselves forward as professionals who can make people more happy at their jobs, more productive, uh, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And organisations, ple more pleasant people to work with, happier places, m very successful financially and also in terms of their status in society, all those variables that we call criteria, yeah. you know, uh, are, are desperately important. And we profess uh, that we can make things better. Mm -hmm. okay? But how can we do that unless we know how those organisations and individuals actually work? I think a lot of people out there you know, must feel a bit funny when somebody goes in and says, you know, I'll make your organisation work better. And then they say, well, how does it work anyway? It's trying to mend something that you don't know how it yeah, works. Yeah. So, uh, but the same with our trade, okay? We've got away with it you know, for all these years and we haven't put enough effort into working out what make, how people come to work as they do mm. and how organisations work as they do. Yeah. And that's a very central coming together of, of stuff in the book. So my farewell address to the section. Do I mention 1965, published in Occupational Psychology 1966, uh, was a systems approach to industrial behaviour. Mm -hmm. And it was you know, my first attempt at trying to explain 
how people come to work as they do. Uh, and over the years, God, yes, yes, uh, I've been trying to, what's the word I want, justify the model. How do you think we could be better? How do you think we could be better at communicating what we do? Well, take it on board. Okay. Uh, take John Stuart Mill, back in 1850, in System and Logic, lovely book, uh, said, we are now about to consider multiple causes and multiple effects, and how they can be brought together to explain how, uh, how it all happens again. Yeah. Uh, and we've, that's what, 150 years ago? Mm. And we still don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. We still haven't got, and you see, this is where all this stuff with big data comes in. Mm. Yeah. Now, we're getting the opportunity now. now. Now, these days, when we were young researchers, we were always limited in the number of variables that we could handle. But the trouble is, I think I got a feeling that uh, the trade is still bogged down on correlational methods. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as a point I made, well, there's not enough teaching and understanding of what's going on with multivariate methodologies. Mm -hmm. People out there know, you know, when you come in as a professional, that their tasks are complex. The, the problem they're giving you is complex. Yeah. Now, if you as a pro young professional, well, an old professional come to that, you know, uh, simplify it down to needing some specific, specific treatment that perhaps you may be peddling, mm. you know, uh, you're, you're seen through. Mm, mm. You know, and not only are you seen through, the profession is seen through. That we are uh, needing in the profession uh, organizational diagnosticians. Well, as I say, some of the uh, the great and the good of the profession, like the people you're seeing on your uh, on, on your tour of the pioneers, <laughs> uh, could well be the people who are able, because of their experience and uh, insights. Jerry, we talked earlier about the challenges of promoting the discipline of occupational psychology. If we take this a bit broader, maybe looking more at the international angle, what do you think? Um, people like you, so senior academics, what is your role? What do you see as your role in promoting the division occupational psychology on a more international basis? Oh yes, I think that's, that's, that's crucial. If, if we can get invited, of course, and it's nice to travel the world at somebody else's expense uh, and talk about what we're doing in Britain uh, and then having people around the world sort of recognize it and apply, respect it and apply it, that it does no harm at all to our standing within our own society. So I think the more we could get off our butts and go and do that, uh, the better. Yeah. And for, for, for example, uh, I was asked to give the, to organize the 1982 International Association of Applied Psychology Congress, 20th Congress, uh, which brought in people, well, 1,500 people from all over the world. And of course, I had a, a big say over who amongst the Brits mm -hmm. uh, we could you know, put forward yeah. as, uh, as the people we want the world to get to know. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, as far as I can remember, until way back, it's the only time that an international congress of psychology has been held in Britain. So people went away with uh, you know, great good vibes about the whole scene, British occupational psychology mm. and, and Britain. So I think it did us the world of good. And then it gave a lead for me. I made, obviously, people uh, to start up work in Singapore. Now, I was asked to design and run an MSc in HRM in Singapore, mm -hmm. uh, which was a very interesting assignment, along with the Singapore Institute of Human Resource Management. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that went well. I mean, again, teaching Singaporean students, in a sense, British-based occupational psychology uh, ahead of the Americans, but in particular the Australians, who were trying to get their foot into Singapore. 
I think did it, I like to say did us the world of good. You've got to have standing in your own country before you start getting the invitations. Mm -hmm. That's the point. So you can't let that slide. You know, but, uh, but if you do put yourself about a bit, and that's, that's, that's how you do it, you, know, you, you may sometimes have to accept relatively low-level invitations to establish yourself and get the word going about that you're good on your feet with overseas people. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it's, it's hard work, mm -hmm. but we've got to keep it going because yeah. the Australians will move into the Far East where they were moving in uh, when I was there you know, with setting up uh, like we set up eventually uh, sp uh, sponsored courses. I mean, we, we now run, the, man the School of Management at Bradford uh, runs uh, accredited courses in Malaysia, uh, Oman, uh, Singapore still, mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, this is all to the good. And so if we're thinking maybe now about the division again a little bit more, um, is there anything that you would change or what do you think is the most pressing thing that we should try and change within the division of occupational psychology? I think the division is bumbling along quite nicely at the moment. I, I got a bit cross with them a few years ago uh, about the chartering uh, procedure. Uh, and also, fr frankly, the presence of diagnosis on the MSc curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, so I engineered myself to be made one of the examiners for DOP. Yeah. And I took over my first sort of expertise, you know, examiner for personnel selection. <laughs> I had to start reading it up again. <laughs> uh, but this gave me access to Leicester. So when we came, one year we reported our results for the main examining board at Leicester, because yeah. no, uh, I know them all quite well, a lot of them, uh, I took the opportunity of asking if I could have a few words with the main board mm -hmm. no, and uh, made my point about, I thought the chartering system was getting heavy, expensive, cumbersome, uh, and in many respects unfair, mm -hmm. particularly for the more senior uh, members who were rather than coming through the, uh, the traditional route of a master's course and a bit of practice, they were come into the profession late. And also I got at them for where was diagnosis on the curriculum. Yeah. They were very good. I mean, yeah. They listened quite hard and so much so that one of the officials of the uh, society promised that he did right round these at 21 then, I think, master's courses, mm -hmm. uh, asking on behalf of the, B the BPS, reply to me, what and how is diagnostic procedures taught on MSc curricula around mm -hmm. the country? I had three replies mm -hmm. uh, from those organisations where I'd been externally examined. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew anyway. <laughs> so that was courteous. So. Uh, but I think the, the, the division is, well, I don't see a great deal of evidence that they've taken on board the, the importance of organisational diagnosis. Uh, and if you ask me what I would like them to do is to push that a bit harder. So part of the importance of organisational diagnostics, is there anything else that you would like the incoming generation of occupational psychologists to be aware of? or to be working on? Oh, yes. <laughs> We're back to motivated analysis <laughs> again. <laughs> Sorry about this. That's the way ahead for me. The, we've, the, the, the new generation has got to get themselves really on top of the, pa the procedures first and then the power of motivated analysis. Mm -hmm. now, if necessary, go back to Cattell's 1966 handbook. Now, big, thick thing, I suppose it's still obtainable and dare I say it read the last chapter of my <laughs> book <laughs> uh, and, uh, that's the answer it has yeah. to be the way these two things the, the two things underpinning the future of our profession as far as I'm concerned uh, is improving our ability 
to diagnose what needs to be done next mm -hmm. by individuals and organisations and to improve the ability of researchers to take into consideration many, many variables you know, in their research, okay? reduce them to the critical ones and then reduce those to the key one which is affecting the performance of that individual or that organisation at that moment of time. Yeah. That, that's to me, is, is the way ahead. You mentioned earlier in passing evidence-based management or evidence-based practice. Yes. Is that something you... That's all part of it. Okay. What is evidence? We used to call it validation mm -hmm. in the early days. You know? And this is one of the, the things that we rename something and make it sound new and therefore different, but it's not. But the, what, what, why validation was not all that effective? Well, it was effective as far as you can look at the IHRP reports. You know, is that they didn't take into consideration sufficient variables, and so people were always a bit unsure mm. of what. Just like in uh, uh, statistics about health and things like that, we're still unsure, or people, some people, people are still unsure about the effects of smoking and things like that because. No. Not everything's been taken into consideration, yeah. and there's no excuse now. Although <laughs> it's hard work. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's the only excuse, okay. and time-consuming. And this is where this what do you call it? We call it RAE. You uh, the ref ref. ref you know, it actually sort of undermines this uh, big-scale thinking and big-scale investigation into what's really going on. Mm -hmm. uh, because people are so encouraged to produce smaller studies and get them published and, mm. and, uh, and that's not good for the profession. Yeah, so I read in the Times Higher people getting at this all the time and, uh, and it's absolutely right, it's unfair. It's, it's, oh, but, but I, I, what did Einstein do in you know, just one or two papers? Mm. Change the world. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got a long way to go.